I love my church. I love the people. We know how to love well. We serve God. We worship God. We're excited about the Word. And I'm so glad that you're a part of it. Oh, hello there. And welcome to... Well, I'll let them say it better. We would like to welcome you to our church. Welcome to our church. Welcome to East Sunnyside. Welcome to East Sunnyside, Church of God of Prophecy. We would like to welcome you to our church. Welcome to East Sunnyside, Church of God of Prophecy. Our church is awesome. Marvelous. Wonderful. Incredible. As, oh, our church is absolutely amazing. Our church is absolutely amazing. Our church is friendly. Our church is full of love. Our church is where you learn a lot of things and how to love each other. Our church is the perfect place for imperfect people. So why do you come to church? We get the real word of God and we love each other. I come to church, the worship is great, the people are loving, and the word is on point. Our church is a place where you can learn the Word of God. I love it because the people are just like family and friends and we support one another and pray for one another and live for the Lord. We come to church because this is a place where one can come and belong, to be a part of something bigger than themselves. I love my church because it makes me so happy. Sometimes when I feel lonely, I think about God and He makes me feel like I'm not alone. Our church is, oh my gosh, loving, welcoming, reviving, uplifting, where miracles happen, I'm telling you. And that's the reason why I love East Sunnyside gave me a new life, it showed me my purpose, and as a baby Christian, as you want to call it, uh, is where I know I'm safe, and there's people around me to teach me and lead me and not make me go astray. Things are hard, but when you come to East Sunnyside on Sunday, it gives you a start to the week that you can go and do what you need to do and come back on and be rejuvenated to go out and start again because life is hard. But he said it's that makes it easy. Um, my church is loving, it's full of family, and it's very welcoming. I come to be rejuvenated and for my family. It's like um, the only day that all of my family can get together. I got to go through my hugs, I got to get my kisses, I got to get everything that I need to make for the next week. So, come, you love me. Oh, well, church is about to begin. We better go grab our seats. Good morning, Sunnyside family, and good morning, Sunnyside friends. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Hey, we have to, again, for the second week in a row, come to you uh, in this medium, but we are grateful to God that we can use social media at such a, in such a time as this to get the word out to the people of God. Today, I want to use for a subject that His grace is sufficient. In 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 7 through uh, 10, Paul writes this, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of, of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan sent to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that, he might, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I will take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then 
am I strong? You know, on the surface, Paul seemed as if he had it all together. And Paul was by no stretch of the imagination an ignorant man. He was highly intelligent and well-versed in several languages. One can surmise that because of his position and proximity with the higher-ups of the religious world, and given his background and his education, Paul must have also had a little chunk of change stored up somewhere. And then, after his conversion, Paul's relationship with God was so off the charts in that God used him mightily and tremendously. The word reveals to us that Paul had been given an abundance of revelations, accurate, precise, and of great quality. And with all of these great things going for him, Paul could have easily gotten the big head, or as the word said, he could have become exalted above measure, and pride very easily could have set in. And so Paul says that a thorn of flesh was given to him by God. And although Paul considered God to be uh, responsible for this thorn that was given to him, he also knew that ultimately it would be used for his good. Now, we don't know what this thorn in the flesh was. It was referred to, uh, it might have referred to an inner turmoil about the church. I don't know. It could have been an ongoing uh, thing with sin that Paul had to deal with in his life. It may have been an ongoing feud with others in the ministry. It could have been a physical ailment. You know, Paul had diminishing uh, eyesight. Or it could have been a demonic oppression that wouldn't leave him alone. But Paul refers to it as a messenger or an angel from Satan that was sent to cause him great pain. Now, if Paul has a good relationship with the Lord and he is doing the work of the Lord and can give all these prophecies and revelations, then why does it seem to him or to us that Satan has any power whatsoever that could affect or impact God's servant? Paul suggests to us that Satan's involvement here could function as an unwilling, unwitting agent of God's discipline. And while Satan intends to harm Paul, God ultimately has something else in mind. And I don't care what it looks like in your life. I want to tell you this morning that God is up to something good. And even though uh, many of us are on the battlefield for the Lord, even though we trust God, we love him, sometimes this road gets rough and we don't want to endure the chastening or the discipline that God hands down to us. Sometimes we don't even think we did anything wrong. Maybe God is just teaching us a lesson. I don't know. But the Bible declares that Paul prayed three times that whatever this thing was, whatever this thorn may have been, he prayed that God will remove it. I want to tell you that even Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Let me, let me let you off the hook. He said, Father, if it be possible, remove this cup from me. But he realized he had to go through what he needed to go through. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And Paul emphasizes that he had pled his case before God, but God has chosen to allow this experience to continue. And then God says, Paul, I don't have to remove this thorn. My grace is sufficient for you to endure. That's my first point this morning and the title of my message. His grace truly is sufficient. God's grace for personal trials is ever and always uh, trials is ever and always able to meet human need. God's grace will always be able to meet human need. Whatever this thorn was, it greatly pained Paul, but God's provision, God's grace was and is sufficient. Now, I need to clarify a few things before I proceed. Many times when we as believers are in the thick of things, we pray like Paul did and ask God to just simply take it away. What we're asking for is mercy. Mercy is God holding back the things that we deserve. For example, when we deserve punishment, God's mercy holds it back. Thank God. And we may deserve retribution, but God's mercy holds it back. But the grace of God is different. Whereas mercy is God holding back what we deserve, God's grace affords to us or gives us what we don't deserve. So what Paul does, what God does for Paul in this instance, is rather than extend mercy, he gives Paul a measure of grace. And this grace is in the power of Christ to help him endure the hardships, to be strengthened while struggling, to function while in dysfunction, and to worship while being wounded. God says, my grace is sufficient. 
The definition of the word sufficient means adequate. It's enough, ample, plenty, abundant, and ultimately satisfactory. God is saying to us through this word that no matter what you are going through, his grace is enough to get you through it. Let me tell you a little something about God's grace. Grace will chase you down. I don't know if you fully understand that, but grace will chase you down. The worst thing we, that could happen to us is that we try to spend a life trying to outrun God because we think he's chasing us to collect from us what we owe him. When the fact of the matter is God is really chasing us to give us what it is we cannot afford. Y'all, grace is a free gift from God. We have to stop trying to earn it, stop trying to work for it. You can't even get grace by works. There is nothing we can do to merit God's ultimate favor. It is a gift that he is so willing to give every one of us, and his grace is sufficient for everything. Grace is powerful enough to erase your guilt. Grace is big enough to cover your shame. Grace is real enough to heal your relationships. Grace is strong enough to hold you up when you are weak, and grace is sweet enough to cure you even from your bitterness. Grace is satisfying enough to deal with your disappointments. Grace is beautiful enough to redeem your brokenness, and grace has the power to help you redeem even your very regrets. There is nothing you can get yourself into that the grace of God won't cover. And so the second clause of verse 9 says, For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Whose weakness? Paul's weakness. My weakness. Your weakness. Saints, my weakness is a mess. But God's strength is perfected. And God is made perfect through my weakness. Here's the second point. His strength is perfect. His strength is perfect. So not only is his grace sufficient, but his strength is perfect. Weakness provides the opportunity for God to show his power. There are too many of us who want to show the world how much we can do in our own strength, but that's not the biblical way. Let me invite you to be weak in the presence of God. There, there is such a blessing in being vulnerable before God, and this is the paradoxical nature of Paul's ministry it should be, and should be the realization of us all. When we are weak, God shows up. And he makes us strong. When I can't do anything for myself, God will show up and do what he does best. My God specializes in the most impossible of situations. When we are helpless and vulnerable, Christ empowers us not to only endure, but gives us victory as well. For this reason, Paul says that he can boast about his weaknesses even through, of, even though others may mock him. I don't care what folks say about you. His grace is sufficient and his strength is perfect. I want to tell you this morning that mourning and crying and grieving may appear weak to some, but you give it to God and let him turn this moment of weakness into a monument of victory. God, give, uh, give God your broken hearts and let him mend it. Give God your heaviness and he will turn it into joy. Give God your burdens and he will lighten your load. Give him your mourning and he will turn it into dancing. Give God all your tears. But the scripture says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. When we are weak and vulnerable and undone and seemingly helpless, it is then that we are strongest. For his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Stop trying to fix things yourself and let God show up and show out for you. Can't nobody do you like Jesus. Can't nobody fix your situation like Jesus. Can't nobody heal you like Jesus. No, nobody can walk with you like Jesus. Nobody can talk with you like Jesus. Nobody can work things out the way Jesus can work things out. Here's my final point. Not only is his strength perfect, but, but his power is my strength. His grace is sufficient. His strength is perfect. But his power is my strength. Let me prove it to you. In the face of of the thorn that remained, Paul did not bemoan his state of affairs. He did not stay where he was complaining about his situation. Rather, he decided to cultivate a brand new attitude. 
For he understood that what was weak in him only served to magnify what was strong about his God. So rather than dwell on how bad his circumstances were, he, I tell you, he, he started talking about how good God is. And I say to you, rather than dwell on how bad things are, start talking about how good your God is. Don't magnify your problems. Magnify your God. I say, big up your God. Big up your God and small up your situations. Why? The bigger you make your God, the smaller your problems will become. We need to stop talking about what people did to us and realize it's bigger what Jesus did for us. No matter what you say about me, Jesus is even bigger than you. Amen. No matter what sickness comes into my body, Jesus is bigger than that. No matter what may have happened in my past, Jesus is bigger than that. His power is my strength. And I can rest knowing what he is able to do. He is able to keep me from falling. He is able to present me faultless. He is able to keep my foot from slipping. He is able to heal my body. He is able to deliver me out of all of my infirmities, my sickness, my frailty, my weaknesses. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that ever I could ever ask or think according to the power that worketh in me. So I rest in his power because his power is my strength. What a mighty, mighty God we serve. Let me close with this. I was reading in my devotions this morning, Psalms 42, verses 1 through 2. And it says, As the deer panteth for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you. My God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go to meet with God? That's the NIV version of Psalm 42, 1 through 2. When I look at this scripture, two images come to mind. First of all, most of us think about this timid little Bambi-like deer that was once thirsty and his wobbly legs are stumbling up to this, uh, just shaking and they're stumbling up to this little lush green forest with this picturesque brook. But truth be told, if you were to put this into the context of a Middle Eastern wilderness, then this little land would be probably coming, probably be coming from a dry, rocky, barren, uh, desert place. And so David points here a picture of sheer desperation. The withered deer is in a parched place and is desperately seeking for something to satiate his thirst. And that's how badly we are in need of God and in, of his grace. Only his grace is sufficient to quench our thirst. Not money, not fame, not fortune, not possession. Only the pure and living water is sufficient. The other image is that of a beast. I love the King James Version. It says, as the heart, the stag, the ram. In other words, it's a larger, formidable animal. Put in proper context, it's a large animal with powerful hind legs that is on the run from a predator. And he has enough lead from the predator to hide, but its scent keeps attracting other predators. So he never gets a break. The only way for predators to stop chasing him is for them to lose his scent. This is why it looks like you and I can't get away from our enemy. Our scent is too strong to hide. You have been in the presence of the Almighty God. You've been in the presence of the Lord where your scent has become a sweet-smelling savor into his nostrils. But to our enemy, it's a pungent yet attractive scent. They, they, they can't stand us, but they're attracted to us. Why? Because they need what we have. They desire what we're made of. So rather than join in and be like us, they fear us. And the only way to satiate their appetites is to eat us up. But if you want to throw off your scent, plunge yourself into the living water. Jump into the river of God. Hide yourself in the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Let the presence of God throw off your scent to the enemy. Throw off your scent from the wicked. Throw off your scent from those who would devour you. His grace is sufficient enough to throw off your scent. His grace is sufficient to confuse your enemies. And get this, his grace is sufficient enough to protect you in the time of your crisis. He protects us in the time of this crisis. 
Listen, the Bible never promises to take away all of our pain or remove our suffering from the brokenness of this world. But Jesus does promise rivers of living water to slake or quench all of our thirsts. The Bible never says you wouldn't be faced with crises or some insurmountable odds. It never says that there wouldn't be any issues in life or there would be no trouble. But I like what Psalms 27 and 5 says, that in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing. Yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. I'm singing today because his grace is sufficient. I, I, I know we have this coronavirus among us, COVID-19, but saints, his grace is is sufficient. I know we are on lockdown. His grace is sufficient. I lost my job. I don't have enough money to pay my bills. You can say whatever you want. His grace is sufficient. I don't know when things will be returning back to normal, when we can go back to the workplace. We can never eat out at a restaurant or make contact again. But I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters. His grace is sufficient. His strength is perfect. And his power is my strength. Can I pray for you? Gracious Father, thank you that your grace is sufficient to this day. God, in this time and everything that we're going through, I'm reminded of the hymn that says, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord." Thank you, gracious Father, for everything. Thank you, Lord, for all that you are, all that you're doing. I magnify your name. I give you praise and honor and glory. And I thank you, God, that even in times like this, I recognize that your grace is sufficient. God bless you, Sunnyside family. God bless you, people of God that tuned in this morning to hear the word of God. I pray it's been a real blessing to you. And I pray that your life is changed forever, that you're different because of of the word of God. I want to encourage you all to remain safe. I believe in the power of God, the healing power of God, the protecting power of God, but also God gave us wisdom to believe the people that are scientists and looking at these things the way we ought to do it. And they've given us some good advice that we ought to adhere to. Take good care of yourself. Stay safe. This too shall pass. Remember a couple of weeks ago, I preached when I see the blood, when God sees the blood the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and on the mantle, when we're covered by the blood, even this shall pass. I want to encourage you all, especially those that are members of our church, if you wish to give, feel free to go online and give uh, at, on our website. That's E S C O G O P, East Sunnyside Church of God of Prophecy dot org slash give. E S C O G O P dot org slash give. Or on your phone, you can text to give. Uh, area code 83266-COGOP. Again, area code 83266-6467. May the Lord richly bless you is my prayer. And I pray to be back with you real soon. Uh, those of you that are listening on Wednesday nights, we also have Bible study via Zoom. Check out our website and you'll see everything that's going on. God bless you. God keep you. I love you. Sunnyside, I miss you. But I can't wait till we get back together again. God bless.